So hello everyone, I am Neil Bornstein. I'm a, sil a senior sales engineer with SUSE. I'm based out of Atlanta. SUSE itself uh, is based out of Germany. Uh, I've been with SUSE for about 13 years. Uh, SUSE itself has been around for 30 years. So you can imagine we've seen some change over those years and some of you may or may not be familiar with SUSE. So I wanted to start out by just reintroducing SUSE to those of you who have heard of us and uh, introducing SUSE to those who have not. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that, you know, we look at the market and, and understand the dynamics out there that our customers are all transforming to deliver their goods and services in different ways. Uh, of course, with the pandemic, that's only accelerated that shift. So our, our businesses in, out there in the market need to integrate digital technologies into everything they're doing. And that's resulting in really fundamental changes. So businesses really need to take an agile approach to IT and, and to software development and delivery. Our customers need software applications to run in multiple environments. And that means not only on-premises versus in the cloud, but that also means different platforms. The traditional business critical, business critical Linux platforms, which is what SUSE is really known for or has been known for for the past 30 years, as well as containerized applications, which is where we're growing now with our acquisition of Rancher Labs about two years ago. And so we are uh, helping our customers achieve all that across those different deliver, delivery platforms and different uh, uh, architectures and across a broad spectrum of, uh, of, of ways of delivering uh, software. So at the heart of our uh, strategy, of course, is our leadership in those two platforms, Linux and Kubernetes. Uh, when it comes to running your workloads, it's important to remember that one size of Linux does not fit all. So we have the industry's most adaptable Linux operating system. So whatever your requirements are, whether you're focused on performance, reliability, the operating environment, we have a, an operating system solution that's built for your needs. And that means we can deliver that operating system uh, across a hybrid cloud infrastructure, whether that's your development workstations or laptops, in your data center on premises, in the public cloud, at branch operations, uh, retail operations, or at the edge, things like power generation. We can deliver uh, all of our solutions at any of those locations. And then in terms of the actual products themselves, SUSE Linux Enterprise is our flagship uh, product, and it comes in multiple flavors for different de uh, deployments, whether that's on the desktop or the server, whether it's something specific like SAP or high-performance computing, or again, for those kind of edge deployments, we have a, a version called SUSE Linux Enterprise Micro. If you're not running one of our Linux distributions, we can still help you manage your choice of enterprise Linux distributions using SUSE Manager. So that's the, uh, the Linux layer, the operating system layer. The same things hold true for Kubernetes. We have the industry's only container management platform that provides full management of any Kubernetes distribution, whether that's something like EKS, AKS, GKE, whether that's our own Rancher Kubernetes, Kubernetes engine or K3S, our two Kubernetes distributions, uh, we can manage any CNCF certified Kubernetes distribution from our Rancher management product. And we have other tools around uh, Kubernetes as well, uh, including Longhorn, which provides block storage for Kubernetes and New Vector, which is our container security product. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. When you look at this chart, I know there's lots of uh, logos on here, but the point of this is we have out of the box integrations with many partners, uh, including tools in the, in the green column here that we provide full SLA support uh, for those tools. And on the, uh, on the orange side where we provide integration support, where we provide the ability to deploy those tools or to manage those tools from Rancher, uh, but we don't necessarily provide the full uh, break fix support. As we talk about uh, our customers' cloud native transformations, security is pretty much the number one area of concern in every discussion. So that we felt it critical to add a comprehensive solution for cloud native security to our Rancher 
container management platform. So last year we acquired New Vector, which is the leader in end-to-end -end cloud native security. And that's where I'd like to focus the rest of this presentation. So the challenge that we see is more and more containerized uh, applications are moving into production. And what happens is in production, you've got real customer data. And that's sensitive data. It could be PCI compliance issues, other types of compliance issues that you need to make sure uh, you're, you're accounting for. In a containerized or Kubernetes cloud native environment, your traditional security tools that you may be using uh, usually don't work or are incomplete relative to the needs of your business. They don't provide the same visibility and protection that you need in a containerized environment. Specifically, Kubernetes has a layer of network abstraction that really makes it impossible for any of the traditional network security tools to see that network traffic, to understand what's going on and determine if there's an attack happening. That's why you need a solution that's designed specifically for containerized cloud native architectures that you can put into those containerized environments. Now, the container attack surface is not just hackers trying to get into your runtime environment, but it's the entire sof software uh, pipeline and the entire uh, software supply chain. So really, we want to start our cloud native security story with the build and test phase where you're building container images. Maybe you're bringing in open source as part of your applications. Critical vulnerabilities can enter at any of these phases and they can come in at all the way through the production cycle, uh, just as we saw with Log4j uh, last year. And I'll use this uh, as a case study later on. So those vulnerabilities may already exist in production. And then suddenly there's a discovery. Someone announces a new CVE. It's been, uh, it's been uh, exposed and you got to find where it's running. So it's critical that you can detect those vulnerabilities end to end throughout the life cycle. Some of the new tools that are being used, whether it's Kubernetes or, or Rancher itself or registries that are being used in your pipelines, these can all be points of attack. Uh, bad actors can try and inject any unauthorized code or images into the pipeline. And this could be done by hacking or it could just be a misconfiguration. Uh, there was a Tesla hack a couple of years ago that was an open Kubernetes cluster that allowed hackers to install crypto mining into, into their uh, production environment. So on top of that, we, we can't put in security controls that are going to break or slow down the pipeline. What we're trying to do, and everyone's trying to do, is release new applications and update them as rapidly as possible. And that can mean hundreds of times a week, uh, new applications being deployed. So you can't require old-fashioned security methods, say, hey, I need a new network connection, I have to contact the firewall team, I have to put an, open a port or a firewall hole. It, it just doesn't work in a containerized environment. So you need that kind of stuff to be automated. So again, going back to the new attack surface, whether that's Kubernetes or the Docker runtime, they could have some vulnerabilities. And then there's layers on top of that, like service meshes, like Istio. Those are also gonna be the target of attackers. And every time you add a new service or a new tool to your cloud native stack, there's the possibility for more, more vulnerabilities to be introduced. So it's a huge headache for the security experts um, to, to worry about. And then finally, you know, when you're looking at in, in production, that's more of a traditional attack surface. So this could be in the application layer itself, someone uh, trying to get into a, a web server, or it could be an API service that's being used, and some of that's getting hacked. So whether that's a, a vulnerability that's known, and it just hasn't been, dis or hasn't been fixed yet, or it could be a vulnerability like a zero day that's not been disclosed and there's no CVE yet. So all of those things have to be monitored and you have to have visibility if there's an attack in progress. And ideally you'd like to prevent that from happening. So all these things still exist e even in a containerized environment, just because we have the new uh, deployment model doesn't mean we don't have to worry about those old kind of things too. So when we talk about full lifecycle security, we also like to talk about layered security. You don't just rely on one security method. You have to uh, rely on multiple layers for multiple vulnerabilities. 
So there's two big buckets here. There's supply chain security, and then there's runtime security. So supply chain security really is about the pipeline, how things happen in the pipeline, how to prevent bad things from entering the pipeline. So for that, we need vulnerability scanning and remediation. We need compliance scanning, such as CIS benchmarks or what other, whatever other uh, compliance auditing you need, um, including looking for maybe secrets embedded in images or containers. And then we need admission controls to prevent vulnerable or non-compliant code from getting into the runtime environment. So that's all the supply chain. Then once things are running in production, we need to scan those workloads for vulnerabilities and compliance violations, just as we did in the pipeline. New vulnerabilities can come up after deployment all the time. And you want to know that workload you deployed, you know, a month ago might suddenly determine that there's a CVE that affects that. You need to know about that, even though you haven't pushed new code out. Then we look at threat-based controls. So that's looking at typical ways a hacker might abuse network connections, like a DDoS attack or a SQL injection or something like that. Um, all of those things we want to make sure we're protecting against. And then finally, uh, something you'll hear a lot from SUSE and New Vector is the notion of zero trust. So that's obviously a big shift that's happening in the security industry right now. We're moving more from an exception-based approach to a zero trust or declarative-based control. We'll talk more about zero trust uh, as we go on here. So just to take a look at the details of, of how we implement uh, these protections in, uh, and when we talk about the full life cycle of container security, you have to start very early in the developer realm. So we tend to break this into vulnerability and compliance management aspects, and then the runtime production aspects. So is to start with build level scanning, whether whatever build tools you're using, that could be Jenkins, Circle CI, Azure DevOps, GitLab. At that point, where developers are building their container images, it should automatically trigger a vulnerability and compliance scan. This ensures if there are any issues, any vulnerabilities in those components, that build can be failed and rejected. Then the developer has to be, uh, it can be forced to remediate those vulnerabilities before they're sent back down the pipeline. The images are then typically put into a registry, so we need to continually scan the registry for vulnerabilities, either uh, because it may have passed our build pipeline, and then a vulnerability has been discovered that wasn't known when the uh, image was originally stored in that registry. So we're constantly updating our CVE database that we use to detect those vulnerabilities. So that's updated pretty much daily in order to incorporate those, those new CVEs, new CIS benchmarks, and any custom audits. Now, the way we tie this to the runtime environment is through admission controls. Uh, admission controls are a gatekeeper between the build and test pipeline environment into the runtime environment. So based upon scanning of images, we can set up rules like do not allow critical vulnerabilities that were discovered more than seven days ago because the developers have had a week to update their pipeline and remove those vulnerabilities. So we don't want to allow any deployments into production that fail those criteria. So admission controls are, are critical uh, as a gatekeeper into that production environment. Now, once you're in production, this is where those traditional security controls as well as the new zero trust security controls need to be implemented. Uh, those are implemented through a layer seven container firewall that's specifically designed for Kubernetes and containerized environments. This firewall can inspect all the network traffic, whether it's east, west, pod to pod, ingress and egress, to look for any of those type of attacks that, uh, that you typically see coming in uh, across your network. And it's important to note, you know, in a containerized environment, you need to look at that pod to pod east west traffic because your your traditional firewalls are not going to be, be looking for that kind of uh, traffic and then uh, container workload security that's really how we inspect and monitor every running container um, and that includes both your application containers as well as your system containers to make sure that the platform itself uh, doesn't have any unauthorized processes or uh, file accesses 
that should be stopped. So with new vector, that's the zero trust approach. We define a list of allowed behavior in your container. Uh, what are the allowed network connections? Again, east, west, ingress, egress. And what are the allowed processes and file activities in a container? Everything else that's not in that uh, trusted list is untrusted and can be blocked when you set it to protect mode. Now, you know, a big issue is you were talking about, again, hundreds or thousands of, of deployments in a week. So how do we keep up the configuration of this, uh, of this zero trust security model? How do we keep up with that rapid deployment pipeline? Well, the answer is security as security policy as code and automation. When you create a new microservice or application, obviously you're storing your code uh, in a code repository. Well, you also create a YAML file that governs the deployment of that application and governs the security of that application. All of that is stored uh, in your code repository. So when you deploy your code, you're also deploying the security policy. And that's gonna define what behavior is allowed, what kind of network connections it's allowed to make, processes and file activities and things like that. So just to recap some of the unique capabilities um, from new vector, first is the automation of security policies. As I was just talking about the ability to uh, generate uh, to, uh, uh, those, those security policies, add them to your code, make sure they're deployed every time you deploy your code. We have a unique ability to gain visibility into your network in production. Again, in a containerized environment, we're inspecting every single connection, every packet that's going between your workloads, between your microservices, between your pods, as well as in and out of the cluster to make sure it doesn't violate any of your rules. And we have that ability to do deep packet inspection. So that uh, enables data loss prevention as well as implementing a web application firewall. So that summarizes the, the core technologies with New Vector. And New Vector is now uh, completely open sourced. Our next release, which is coming out this summer, is our first open source version. So the products are all completely open source. And, uh, and New Vector, uh, when we bought it, we made the promise to open source the code and we are uh, making good on that promise. So just to wrap up a little bit about the Log4j uh, situation that happened uh, last year and how we helped our customers uh, prevent and recover from that, uh, that issue. So we call it a, a kill chain because it's a massive security breach is, is usually just one event. It's not usually just a single hack. It's usually a chain of events. There's an ingress, there's an exploit. Uh, in this case, there's remote code execution. It could be a, a connection back to a command and control node where some malware, ransomware, crypto mining software can be downloaded and exploited, or, or it can just go straight to, to breaching the data. So how we protect against this uh, is to give the most chance of detecting the the uh, the issue at any point in the kill chain. So, first, detection and remediation. When this vulnerability was first disclosed, everyone scrambled and needed to scan all of their container images in their registry to see if the vulnerability existed in any of their images, and then they needed to scan all their running containers to see if there was an immediate risk uh, because it was actually running in a container. We've already talked about how. We do both those things uh, automatically. And so this depends on the CVE being disclosed. Uh, we can do those scans and make sure uh, we know whether we're vulnerable. Once it's detected, you can say, okay, I have to remediate it. So let's send it back through the pipeline, get the newest version and deploy that back to production. If you're running a highly automated pipeline that could be done the next day. For some people, it could take even longer. It could take a week to a month. Uh, so that's where we come into the admission controls. Uh, we can put a, a deadline on that uh, redeployment and say, hey, we're not going to allow that bad code back into our environment uh, if it takes more than a week. And then we have to look at prevention. So if we can prevent the vulnerability from getting into the image in the first place, that's great. Uh, 
Sometimes though, again, an existing image could be in the registry, didn't get detected, um, and there could be follow on vulnerabilities. So more CVEs come out. So you have to run the scan for the first disclosure and then there's still a vulnerability because the second one wasn't disclosed yet. So again, those admission controls uh, can, uh, can help uh, uh, define what is allowed into your environment and to make sure that if there was some code that was based on a certain image version uh, or package version, those controls can keep it from getting out into production. But the most important thing is continuous protection. We want to make sure that even before we know that there's a CVE, we can block unauthorized activity. So that's the day zero uh, protection. That means that the zero uh, trust protection governs the allowed behavior of your containers. It could govern the uh, behavior of your actual hosts and the network connections. And again, processes and files on those nodes so that any attempt to try and exploit that vulnerability would be detected and possibly blocked. And that means we can detect and block them before the CVE is even disclosed. Then finally, um, after day one plus, right, after the CVE was disclosed, we've already talked about how we identify it in the, in the registry with runtime scanning, uh, in production, all those different ways. But we, we wanna make sure that we add additional rules. Once the CVE is disclosed, we can actually put rules in our WAF to make sure that none of those exploits are even gonna get into your system. So we'll block anything that comes in um, and then we'll automatically quarantine any container that has that uh, vulnerability uh, discovered in it. Now, of course, if it's part of critical business logic, that could impact the business. So we wanna make sure automatic quarantines are used uh, very carefully. And then of course we go back to the admission control rules. So that would be a very specific admission control rule to a particular CVE. So again, that's a, an example of a very specific uh, exploit, the log4j uh, kill chain and how new vector would have handled that. So okay. just to sum everything up, okay. uh, you know, Cloud native security should not be an afterthought. You can't assume it's going to be built into the cloud platform. They have very good security tools in the public cloud container uh, platforms, but that's the infrastructure. We have to protect the applications as well. It has to be automated and it must have that zero trust level of protection. And speaking of trust, you know, here's our, our logo slide. So these customers all trust us. So I hope you'll consider trusting us as well with your security.